I was saying, I became a resident in psychiatry yeah. in 1958 at Einstein, yeah. at Einstein and uh, one of my first supervisors that I was assigned by chance was Thompson. Really? He was sort of a very interesting person in that he, on the one hand, was very open mm. and uh, personal, right. but I think his life was in sort of compartments, mm. and each compartment was somewhat separate right. from the other. And uh, I think the way uh, Milton Rosenbaum put it once was, he said, well, Thompson will tell you something about something that he had experienced mm -hmm. or happened or someone he knows, and you'll think it's outrageous, but it's oh. absolutely true, he said. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I actually was, I would say, scrupulously mm -hmm. honest. He was very interested mm -hmm. in uh, schizophrenia and the mm -hmm. problem of psychosis. And very articulate, mm -hmm. clear thinking, mm -hmm. with very definite ideas about mm -hmm. lots of things. Right. So he was just right for, mm -hmm. for me. So okay. we met a lot, talked a yeah. lot. He saw patients mm -hmm. uh, with me to help me as mm -hmm. I was learning. And uh, I got to know him uh, pretty well. He, uh, in fact, when most people were interested in treating the most docile mm -hmm. patients, he was interested in uh, treating, working with the most severely ill people. And he had an amazing ability to make contact with patients. Uh, I actually recall in that first year, mm -hmm. I was assigned a patient. He was a strapping young man of about 20, you know, six, more than six feet tall, 6'2". He was in a catatonic stupor. Mm -hmm. And people were quite afraid of him because he was a huge man and uh, catatonic and a shift to excitement at any moment. People were quite afraid of him. And to some extent, I was. He never. He didn't say a word. So Thompson uh, went to see him with me, mm -hmm. and they, he just sat there facing him. And uh, he said, "Well, I think the thing to do is to move your arm." And he took this man's arm and he moved his arm, and then he began exercising his arm. And uh, then he helped him to stand up, and he had him walking around, and sort of moving him, moving his body, saying very little, not asking him what he was thinking, and, you know, the usual kinds of things that people might ask. And uh, this lasted about 15 or 20 minutes. Now, Thompson had an idea. He thought about people with schizophrenia as uh, having a almost two kinds of, two varieties, what he spoke of as uh, temporal and physical. And he spoke about the difference between time and what is physical. Yeah. And, and the, the point of time being that it's intervals. And his, he experienced this mm -hmm. man as a, a person who's had what he would call physical schizophrenia. Well, gradually this patient, mm -hmm improved. And I, following that, I used to spend a lot of time with this fellow, uh, uh, not speaking with him, very, gradually started walking together, occasionally started to speak to me and talk to me a little bit about himself. About a year later, he was now non-psychotic, he said to me, do you think I could see Dr. Thompson again? Mm -hmm. He'd never, he'd seen him that one time, mm -hmm. for 10 or 15 minutes. Thompson had, had identified himself by name. Right. He never saw him again after that. But he'd had a tremendous, made a tremendous impression on him, and I think he did have that quality of, of making a very strong impression on, on uh, people. And it was around that time that he told me about his experience of uh, entering the uh, concentration camp at Bergen-Belsen uh, when he was uh, the RCAF, the RCAF. Yes, yeah. that's right. And. Uh, he said he was just overwhelmed when he got there. Now, of course, unfortunately, I didn't have a tape recorder, right. and I didn't take notes. And I thought, you know, I was going to be talking with him anyway yeah, for 20 yeah, years yeah, or more. Yeah, yeah. Proved not to be the case, unfortunately. Mm. But uh, as I understood it, after the camp was liberated, and I guess this must have been close to the end of the war, at any rate, at one point, he led a whole group of survivors of that concentration camp 
And how they got there, I don't know. Whether they walked part way, took trains, all the way to what is Oviv. He had told me that he knew a, a woman, I think she was a, some aristocracy, mm -hmm. who owned this land with a large building on it. And that she had offered to have him use the grounds of the building. Uh, I think he had obtained a job at that point with UNESCO. Yes, absolutely. And uh, he uh, he worked, and I don't know if they built some. There was some temporary housing or whatever that yeah. that yeah. Uh, people yeah. lived on there, and he lived there at Oviv yeah. with these survivors for a few years. Mm -hmm. Well, you knew about that, didn't you? Um, you see, I found that the operations diary of the Royal Canadian Air Force unit that he was with. Oh. Mm -hmm. And um, they were actually the... I mean, the thing about John Thompson is that he's always doing several things. I mean, what I've learned is that there's always several things at once. Mm -hmm. So what they were meant to be doing was dismantling Luftwaffe installations. Uh -huh. But oh. they were actually stationed very near to Bergen-Belsen. So mm -hmm. I think that's very likely. Also, the, um, the survivors of Belsen, because of the typhus epidemic, weren't let out. They had to stay put for a mm. very long period. Mm. So that I think, I mean, there were many who wanted to go to Palestine. And, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was very difficult and very frustrating situation, but they were regarded as a health risk and the sure. British didn't want to let them into yes. Palestine. There were all these problems and so on. So that it's, it's actually very, um, um, the fact that there would have been a group of people who would have wished to go to France uh -huh. is absolutely I remember him telling me and now that you mentioned this that he said it was amazing that after the liberation of the camp the death rate continued because they were so yeah. sick that's right they couldn't yeah. do any uh, well they could do very little mm -hmm. in fact for typhus I mean mm -hmm. they had the disease I mean they could clean the camp up and so on but it was a very it was very limited what they could do um, interesting with typhus is you, um, if you have the disease, you hallucinate. Is that right? Did he talk about that experience with people who were sick? Because I've, um, I've talked to people who had typhus, and I've often said, did you, when you were sort of delirious, did you, did you dream of anything? And, so on? and we'll often say yes. Mm -hmm. um, and it will be a sort of displacement, a sort of wish fulfillment. Mm -hmm. But they will sort of see themselves as back home, or see themselves um, at a wedding. And it's a very, um, I think, interesting. There's also a sort of, when you're recovering, you can be semi-paralyzed. Yes. Well, severely. he didn't, he didn't, didn't talk I don't about, remember him speaking to me about typhus. About I don't remember. He said that the, uh, that the people that he accompanied to Aviv, mm -hmm. some were floridly psychotic mm -hmm. and others were not. He did say that there were some that were schizophrenic mm. and paranoid. In fact, he told me, I do remember this, to take a step forward and then back again, mm. that when uh, he, he must have been after the Nuremberg trials, yes, when, yes. when did they... Um, finished in uh, July 47. That was, I mean, yeah. the medical It trial. must have been a bit after that. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know exactly when that he left Paris and went to Oxford, where he worked at the Warneford Hospital. Yes, that's right. You yeah. know that. Yeah, yeah. And um, well, I <laughs> should know, the Warneford has a, it's a bit like O.V., the Warneford actually has an archivist. Oh, is that right? Yeah. And I've asked them about uh, John Thompson and so on, and uh, the archivist has also asked people who were around at that time and so on. That way hasn't worked. But he did work at the Child Guidance yes. Clinic, and Child Guidance is run by the local authority, mm -hmm. so that I've got to go to the local. It's, it's, he did tell me yeah. that. In fact, once when I was thinking of uh, spending some time in England, he suggested the Child Guidance Clinic at Warneford, and he gave me the name of the person at that time, which I no longer remember. I can't remember. That would be a link. <laughs> but when he was there, apparently, he learned later, one of the extremely anti-social members mm. of that group right. at, back at Oviv said that he apparently he told he called a group meeting 
and he said that uh, he'd gotten a message from Dr. Thompson that they were all to leave, and they all, the community was broke up at that point. And he heard about it, he went to Paris, and everyone was going. He also told me that when they arrived, finally, now coming back to when they first arrived, mm -hmm. they, they decided they were going to have a community. By the way, he thought of it as a community for survivors of... He, he thought of his interest as an interest in the problem of man-made disasters, mm -hmm. that's the way he put it. Okay. Uh, and when they arrived, they were going to discuss how the community was going to govern itself. And they decided, he said, that they would... Uh, organize themselves so that everything they did was the opposite of the way life was in the concentration mm -hmm. camp. So they went through the various list of all the indignities and they, they said, well, well mm -hmm. the opposite would be this. They finally got to one of the, one of the characteristics of the camp was paperwork. Mm -hmm. When they said that paperwork, they tore up all their written rules and they decided they were not going to have any written rules but they would uh, live using a sort of a town meeting discussion mm -hmm. decision method. Interesting. Good. I was going to ask you if there was any mention of the difference between schizophrenia produced by or illness, mental illness produced by being in a concentration camp, this situation, as opposed to hereditary yeah. or whatever. Well, John never denied the the, the role of biology. He himself was originally trained as a physiologist. Mm -hmm. One of the people who influenced him a great deal was Martin Buber. Right. And uh, Thompson had, had, I remember him saying to me, uh, at maybe sort of after some conference we mm -hmm. went to, in the, you know, in the uh, Grand Rounds where mm -hmm. lecture talked about the treatment of the, 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 the uh, more recent mm -hmm. drug for the treatment of schizophrenia. And he said, well, I, I, I don't deny that this helps, but he said, I, I know that sometimes I meet with a patient, the patient, at the beginning of my meeting with the patient, the patient is totally crazy, and at the end of the meeting, the patient is totally different. And he said, I think that it is, the way he put it was, that it is the communing relationship that heals. Now, Milton had told me something that I, Milt Rosenbaum, that yeah. I, I hadn't been really aware of, but apparently Thompson was uh, converted to Catholicism when he was in France. And the person who handled that was the man who later became the Pope, Pope uh, John. Uh, we never really uh, spoke of that. I also knew that he didn't publish very much. He published some things about physiology in his early career. And I think about the capillaries in schizophrenic okay. yes. patients. Okay, yes, yes, uh, yes, But he helped edit a lot of things. Yeah. And I remember once reading, yeah. he'd been asked to review a book by Columbia University Press, mm -hmm. and he was very harsh in his criticism. But the interesting thing to me was his criticism, this was a sort of a psychoanalytic book. Yeah. I, I no longer know who wrote that book. But maybe I never knew. I don't think he, he was too discreet. But the criticism was at the person's lack of understanding of psychoanalytic theory mm -hmm. and thinking. And I found that very interesting. Right. Because uh, most people wouldn't have thought that he would have been special, mm -hmm. particularly knowledgeable. But he was extremely brilliant and extremely well read. Had he met Freud or Anna Freud? Or I know he knew Anna Ernest Anna. Jones. And uh, he told me once a funny story. And I think. He had corresponded with Freud, right. but I don't know that he ever met him. I know that he was in Vienna in the late 20s. Really? And he was to do a uh, some sort of fellowship with a very famous physiologist, or maybe a pathologist. I'm pathologist, a pathologist, I think. Yeah. yeah, pathology was certainly an interest yeah. of his, because he, yeah. he spent some time with someone called Ashoff in Freiburg. Ah, well, uh, then that would fit. Mm -hmm. He he told me that he went one evening to uh, a restaurant with some friends, mm -hmm. and there was a tremendous ruckus in the restaurant, and he saw someone being beaten and thrown out. Mm -hmm. He got up and he said, mm -hmm. what's happened? And the man said, oh, don't worry, sir, it's only a Jew. It sounds like something from Cabaret. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that, 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 he said that. 
-hmm. And the next day he went to the uh, laboratory with his mentor, and the mentor said to him, I think you should leave Vienna, go back to England, and tell everybody what's happening here. Uh, Rosenbaum will tell you when he met him, I think he met him in Boston. Mm -hmm. Rosenbaum was a Freud fellow in, uh, at, at Harvard, I think, or, and uh, Thompson was mm -hmm. uh, working there. Mm -hmm. He had taught, actually he had taught at Swarthmore, that I also know, he taught mm -hmm. philosophy at Swarthmore. That's philosophy, okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, Swarthmore, I don't know if you mm -hmm. know, it's a small college here in uh, Philadelphia. Near Philadelphia. Near Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Very right. first rate. Beautiful uh, place. Beautiful yeah. place with very serious mm -hmm. students. Uh, I don't know, do you know of or have you met Martin Wang? W A N G H. Now, I think Martin is now mm -hmm. back in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, Martin Wang was a psychoanalyst. He was German mm -hmm. and uh, he escaped in time. I know that Thompson had been involved with him in okay. something, I don't know if it, was, it wasn't really Holocaust studies, but something really? to do with the reparations. Okay. Uh, yes, I think he was very concerned about compensation yes. for victims. Yes, and, and Wang had yeah. been involved. Wang had told me once he had gone back to Berlin well after the end of the war, probably in the late 50s mm -hmm. or early 60s, in conjunction with reparations for his own family, and told me that when he mm -hmm. got off the plane, he just felt terrible about being there. Right. And I think he had mentioned, Rosenbaum will know more about oh. this, that Thompson and he had been involved in some way with the problem of compensation and mm -hmm. reparation to victims of the, the Holocaust. I did know that he had interviewed, I didn't know so much about the doctor's interviews, but mm -hmm. he interviewed uh, Hess at Nuremberg. Right. Really? Not the Rudolf Hess no. in the single, no. which okay. there are two of them. Two. Rudolf. Rudolf. He, yeah. Rudolf is the well-known one. I mean, yeah, Rudolf Hess was... He was the guy that parachuted in. Yes, and, and they didn't know whether he was yeah. mentally fit to yeah. stand trial. But there was another... So that he was a psychiatric... Yeah, it may, have been, psychiatric he's, it may have been he's the one that... But he, he did tell me he'd interviewed a oh. number of the... Uh, uh, I've seen interrogations. People. That's, I mean, that's one of the sources that I've used. I see. Um, and he is tri he was trilingual. Yeah. Uh, 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 well, he spoke Spanish, French, German, and English that I know of. Mm -hmm. He may have spoken other languages. How did he end up in the in the Canadian? Uh, you know, I don't. Uh, he was I, in Ottawa. No, the way it worked, um, I think I might have worked that one out from. Mm -hmm. He was at Harvard mm -hmm. um, in this lab of um, L. J. Henderson, mm -hmm. and at the same time doing schizophrenia research right. with um, someone called William Corwin uh -huh. at Walton Hospital, Walton, Massachusetts, right, right, Walton, outside of right, Boston. Walton. right. And when war was declared in Europe, when it broke out, a number of American physiologists went to Toronto, where, and Toronto became a center for partly for the British to do aviation medical research, and partly for, because it was safe, it was out of the bombing, and, um, and also Americans. Um, and there were some Americans, because of Sherrington in Oxford, like John Fulton, there was also someone mm -hmm. called Bazette and so on. They all, Toronto was a real sort of lynch. It was a way of and supporting that, the war effort, that's not right. being right in the middle. And um, so John Thompson, he had this, because he studied at Edinburgh, mm -hmm. right. um, and he did volunteer quite early on for the Royal Canadian mm -hmm. Air Force, but they wouldn't have him. They wouldn't have him because, on, for medical reasons, he had some lung problems. But then, because of his scientific work, and I have actually, um, I recognize the names of, of um, a physiologist whom I knew uh, because he was um, someone called Bill Gibson, and he were, had worked with John Thompson, oh. really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in 41, 42. Wow. Um, and they were doing pre-breathing of oxygen for flight crews, and I think his previous work on respiration and uh, sort of anoxia and schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know what the concept. Well, I do know one thing you know, that he did tell me about that aspect. I know a little. He said that there was a lot of concern at the time, 
uh, to know some fighter pilots, when they went into steep dives and came out, mm -hmm. blacked out. That's right, what they call and, bends. And in addition to losing the pilot, they were very concerned about losing the planes because they didn't have any. And they wanted to see mm. if they could differentiate people who were likely to black out mm. from those who were not. And Thompson did some physiological studies also uh, measuring the physiological aspect of the physiological effects of anxiety. And he did find that the people who developed high anxiety levels were more subject to blackout. And so he, he, he gave a report and he told right. me this because he was, it had it for, for some other reason. Yeah. And that was the, uh, what do you call the uh, uh, American preoccupation with numbers. Because his original report read high likelihood of blackouts, moderate and low likelihood. And they said, well, we can't use this. So he converted it to numbers and the report was accepted. <laughs> he said, eight out of ten chance, yes, yes. five out of ten chance, two out of ten chance. And I said, well, that's fine. <laughs> right. Because yeah. yeah. that's had more right. reality. Yeah. But anyway, so he did, uh, he, I, I did know that he had done some of that uh, kind of work. Yeah. Uh, also, I, I never did ask him, I guess I was, I, I was shy about it. I, yeah. I never asked him how his family ended up in Mexico. Um, I think his father worked for Shell. That was a puzzle, because I, um, I'd i seen on his, I think, his, his military record that his father was a mathematician in Puebla, mm -hmm. Puebla Pio, and I couldn't quite work it out, but he was, and also um, relatively wealthy, and what he was doing as a mathematical consultant. Mm. And um, I then saw on some other record that, or I think, Oh no! It was I think the, perhaps the Mrs. Lippman, or that Lippman, uh, Sebastian, Sebastian Lippman's widow. Yeah, yeah. I never did know her. And I think she said anyway. It was through some contact, and th that explained it. That the uh, that he was in um, the father was some oil exec. Uh, I think some I oil executive or doing something. He one was sent to Mexico. Yeah. So now I met his brother at the time of not long after his death. Yeah. Because about a year after his death, Rosenbaum arranged for there to be uh, a memorial right. service, yeah. uh, which was held up at the medical school. Was it that much after his death? Well, it was some time. Yes. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It was some time. And uh, you met his I think Frank. Oh yeah, I met Frank. 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 At that time, Frank was working for uh, was a was an editor mm -hmm. for. Uh, and MD? Yeah, MD Magazine, right. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, which was a quite a lavish magazine mm -hmm. that uh, was produced for a number of years. Mm -hmm. So I met him at that time, but have not didn't see him since. Mm -hmm. Now that's a very long time ago, so I, I, I doubt that he's Do still you know, alive. Is he still alive? Do you know? I've not been able, I mean, I um, checked medical directories and so on. And well, Frank I'm lived on uh, East 80... Fit. Which is the street that goes across from the from the park? In the park, because I met Frank in his apartment. Yeah, okay. and I think it's in East 85th Street. He lived. Mm -hmm. so I don't know he's gone now. There was there were I don't know if the other. At the time Thompson died, his mother was still alive, mm -hmm. and he had a sister also, I believe. Mm. I, I, I think it was quite a large family, and yeah, I think there was another brother in Texas. Yeah. Um, there were that's right. There were family something. elsewhere in mm -hmm. the states. His mother was still in uh, mm -hmm. Mexico, I believe. Mm -hmm. Uh, so she must have been quite well along, because he was almost 60 when he died. Mm. So he came from an educated, yeah. well-to-do family, right? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I mean, his school record is, it gives that he was part educated in Switzerland, part at a school near Edinburgh, so I suspect he went to one of these, and that I should be able to find out. That if I contact these, well, there are a number of public schools around yeah. Edinburgh. Hmm. Mm -hmm. He went to uh, medical school in Edinburgh. And then he went to... Um, did, now, there was, a famous, there was a famous philosopher at the University of Edinburgh, McMurray, was that his name? McMurray. Mm. There was a Gilbert Murray in Oxford, who we know. No, I don't mean... Uh, there was a, could be, I'm mixing two names no, no. There was a very well-known... Mm -hmm. at, um, at, at the University of Edinburgh, mm. because I, uh, Thompson had talked about him, and I, had recommended him as somebody to read. 
So I didn't write these things down. Uh, I, I, at the time, yeah. my memory was a little bit better than it now is. And I remember that. That was a long time ago. Yeah, it was 40 years right. ago. I mean, the puzzle is, is how one writes a biography of somebody who published next to nothing and left, as far as I can see, no private papers. Yes. Now, you know, <laughs> there was an interesting... I don't know what happened to his private papers, but I do know that there was a, a personal library mm -hmm. was donated to the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Right. And for a long time it was kept in uh, the library in Jacoby Hospital as a Tom Thompson collection. Right. It may have been moved or it may have been okay. broken up and okay. stolen. I saw it last December. I went up to the Bronx Psychiatric Hospital. Is it there? And At the Thompson was, building? It wasn't in the Thompson building. It was in, I think, must have been the sort of main administrative block. I see. And there was a hospital administrator who was sort of looking after it. And she had set it up. May have been, I think I was sort of prompting them because I'd, I, I'd, I'd rung them over, a, <laughs> over quite a long time uh, saying, look, I'd like to see these books and, and, and so on. So she'd set it up. But the books are now apparently back in boxes. And it, was a, it is a very interesting collection yes. because there is a lot of poetry, mm -hmm. dedicated volumes, things like Stephen Spender. Mm -hmm. There were some photographs of neurologists sort of with dedications. Who was it who called when we were at his apartment? Elizabeth Bishop. Elizabeth Bishop, Elizabeth Bishop. American poet. We were visiting him one day. Okay. I listed as many titles as I could. I was there for about uh, mm. four or five hours. That's really uh, sad. I couldn't get... It. And it, it, I mean, his idea, I think, was to have a was to have a library which physicians and staff could go to for relaxation. And unfortunately, it's I think you know it was I I, I think they'd set it up just you know mm. they felt they ought to. And well, I, I think that the library. I had the feeling, I mean, I saw the library. His library was in glass cases for a period of time right. at Jacoby Hospital, not at Bronx Psychiatric, where Jacoby is where okay. Thompson had taught originally. And I feared that that library would be plundered. There were wonderful volumes there. And I remember once he lent me, when I was interested, he lent me a book mm. written by Ad Nansen about... That's there. It's his it's, it's a dedication. With a dedication. With a, a dedication. Yeah, it's really it. interesting. I mean... Um, it was, I, I was very excited by it because, for example, there was um, a volume about the history of the Jews with the dedication of Leo Alexander, mm -hmm. dated 1938. Yes. And I thought, gosh, that's just really interesting that um, Alexander, because he worked alongside Alexander in yes. the Nuremberg Medical yes. Trial, that he that knew him so yes. previously. And um, so, but I also had the impression that it wasn't completely intact. Yeah. But it was still perhaps about three, 350 books. Yeah, the, 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 his books. books all have personal meaning to him, is the way I Yeah. It. And I think that is the essence of the man. Yeah. And for, you mentioned Spender. Uh, I, I never met Spender, but I know that Spender was a friend of his. Mm -hmm. And I know for a fact that Auden was, because I met him. And Auden had been speaking at this memorial. Oh, and, spoke. and I took so, advantage mm -hmm. of <laughs> Knowing he lived in Manhattan and I lived in Manhattan, I said, uh, before anyone else could, I said, I'd be glad to give you a lift because <laughs> I wanted the opportunity to oh, be the same see, car with it. Right. But uh, they, I know they used to go to the opera mm. pretty regularly. Oh, I see. Okay. And uh, th this is what I meant when I said that his li he had these lives yes. that didn't, with groups of people that never touched each other. Yeah. But I think that he, he had this strong interest in personal relationships. Yeah. I want to mention to you some things I have here. Yes, please. Now, for the last few years of Thompson's life, I'm going to give this to you. Uh, we participated in a seminar about mm -hmm. hallucinations. You're having mentioned hallucinations. Yeah. By the way, that leads me just to the briefest story. Yeah. When I was in the car with mm -hmm. Auden, yeah. He'd asked me what kind of work I did, and I told his psychiatrist in that that uh, th that I had been working with Thompson on the problem of hallucination. And Auden said, "Hallucinations? Have I ever had a hallucination?" I thought that was very interesting. Mm -hmm. He immediately 
It's hard to think. And he finally concluded, no, I don't think I've ever actually had a hallucination. But he was open to the possibility, yes. whereas most people w yeah. would not. Anyway, so I took it upon myself mm -hmm. uh, from each meeting that this, mm -hmm. that this seminar had. I, I, I recorded them right. and I took notes. Okay. And so I have here selectively some where Thompson was active, oh. quite active. So this, for example, is a case history, mm -hmm. and then this is Thompson's interview, actually. Uh, and it's not the same unless you hear his voice, I must say. There is a, a paralinguistic element okay. here that you... I was, uh, yeah. That's why I was so uh, hopeful, hopeful to hear the well, tapes, because I thought, gosh, if I terrible. could only hear his voice... That and then, there's, a then there is this... Uh, yeah. uh, some comments of his. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this also is a case and where he did something extraordinarily interesting. Mm -hmm. The patient was interviewed, the, the doctor had the patient make a drawing of her hallucination. And you'll see here, it says, Thompson examined the drawings the patient made on two occasions of a hallucinated bird-like animal. He pointed out that by turning the picture upside down, the head of the animal bore a striking resemblance to that of a cat. The patient revealed to him that she had had a mother and father cat, which had several litters of cats. She emphasized the cats were white. The cats would at times jump on her bed in the middle of the night, waking her from sleep, seeing the cats in this way, yeah. upside down, so to speak. So the hallucination almost became an image of this experience, which was elicited by yeah. his mm -hmm. artistic... Yeah. And here is a talk in which he gave some comments about ideas about, these are my notes. They're not verbatim, pretty close to his, uh, his thinking about psychotic conflict, dilemma, mm -hmm. and then uh, some of his thinking about, uh, he said, for example, he says, one primal dilemma may be considered to be the relationship of quality to quantity. Mm -hmm. A simple example may be given, a seemingly straightforward statement that we would all agree as follows, we should all we should have universal excellent education. On closer examination, we can see that the word excellent means unique or exceptional. How can the unique be general? We resolve the dilemma by explaining it away. We call into play various defensive maneuvers to avoid awareness of this paradox and thereby convince ourselves that the paradox does not exist. Right. He once told me, I, now that I see yeah. this, I remember he said about the relationship of quality to quantity, he said the French always say that they prefer quality to quantity. Yeah. So I ask you to go to a Frenchman and say, would you rather have this perfect $1 bill or this sort of imperfect $100 bill? <laughs> uh, he did have a sense of humor. Hmm. This is a very interesting talk he gave, where he described, he differentiated art from science and philosophy by what they do. And then he considered it in terms of the case of Macbeth, right. he was trying to understand. And, uh, so these would have been at Albert Einstein. These were at Einstein. Ein, these right. were at a yeah. seminar, and Ein. they were. Uh, I helped. I conducted it with uh, Walter Cass, who was a right. psychologist. And Thompson joined it, and he was a very okay. active participant. The name Weiner. He, I think Dora Weiner is the yeah. wife. Isn't, isn't uh, is that right? Herb Weiner's wife, well, but this is a different Weiner. It's a different Weiner. This is Mel That's Weiner. Oh, right. Okay. And, uh, but you're right, you're thinking of Herbert Weiner yeah. and his wife Dora, the historian. Yes. Yeah, it's not them. So it's Herb one. was at Einstein also. Yes. But he wasn't a participant in these. Right. Uh, did he know John Thompson? Yes. He did. He did know.